43. Number 43. And stand together. Everyone standing. Oh, what can it wash away my sin? singing when we get home.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Let's all stand together as the choir comes down. Teenagers, you may come up. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, thank you so much for being in the Lord's house tonight. Got a few announcements I want to go over with you uh, before our teenagers sing. Uh, Saturday morning visitation at 10 a.m. Uh, still accepting uh, backpack uh, items and school supplies for Backpack Sunday on August the 9th. Items can be placed uh, in the boxes provided on the game floor. If you have any questions, please see Miss Shannon Vanderford. Uh, on Tuesday, August 11th, the ladies are invited to help label snacks for Brenner's Children's Hospital. Meet in the Fellowship Building at 10 a.m. If you have any questions, please see Ms. Vicki Tuttle. Uh, junior camp will be August 10th through the 14th. Registration forms and sign-up sheets for campers and volunteers are in the vestibule. And uh, please help us on driving, fellas, if, uh, if you can. And we need some drivers during the day. And the sign-up sheet should still be in the back with Fredericks. Is that correct? Is it still back there? Okay. And uh, please help us out with this. And I want to try to cut down um, the load on Brother Frederick as far as driving. And so if you can help us with that, I'd sure appreciate it. And uh, need to have your CDL unless we, uh, maybe the guys, I haven't got the exact number down to see um, about vans or not. But uh, if you can help drive, whether you have your CDL or not, see us that way we can, uh, we can work it out and maybe work around it. And, but we will need CDL drivers as well. So please sign up in the back if you're able to help for that. That's August 10 through the 14. And the 12th we'll not be having uh, junior camp, which is on Wednesday. Youth club activity, Saturday, August 15th from 1 to 3. Uh, hot dogs and gym games in our gymnasium. And uh, that's all youth club ages. Uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, youth club begins Wednesday, August the 19th, and uh, please keep that in mind. And birthday celebration for Brother Clint will be the 16th after the PM service, and then the Rochesters will be with us on September 13th, Sunday night, and uh, for the Sunday PM service. Uh, Zane's birthday, of course, is Friday, and we want you to continue to bring cards if you have them, and we'll get them up there to him. Uh, we're not going as a church uh, on Friday uh, because of the recent uh, events that have transpired with Zane, and uh, I'll tell you more about that at the end of the service, but we certainly want to be much in prayer uh, for the family and for him. Uh, very important decisions need to be made today, and uh, so we're praying for God's wisdom, and I've tried to keep you updated on the phone tree and through Facebook, and uh, so you, you join with me in prayer, and we'll have a time of prayer to end the service tonight uh, for Zane and for the family, but to thank you so much for being here. The youth choir is going to sing this time. You pray for them as they do. Him throughout the course of time. So many 
still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds and every one of them will say without exception that they find brought his people through and then he came to show his love and died for me and you then he rose again to prove that every story has been true Jesus being there. It's so encouraging to know, however deep we're in despair. Jesus never fails. What can I do to prove to you? Tell me how can you deny? No untold facts, no mysteries, it's all so cut and dry. to testify Jesus never fails Jesus never fails Jesus never fails You might as well get thee behind me Satan, you cannot prevail because Jesus 
take Brother Frederick's time. Daniel chapter number 3, verse number 17. And those who sing in the special, y'all ready? Okay, good. Verse number 17, Daniel chapter number 3. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, well, I tell you, I could run all over this building on but if not. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. If not, with God is a whole lot better than what the world has to offer. And I'm glad, but if not, they knew God was in control. They knew everything that happened to them crossed by God's almighty desk. Nothing was gonna touch them that didn't come through God first. And I'm thankful that I know that and that we, we know that as a church. And in light of Brother Zane, he may, be, he may be on the tracks tied down, ready for the train to get him. He might be. But I know for a fact he's been there before. And I know God has delivered him before. And if God wants to, he can do it again. And I'm thankful we serve a God like that. And he knows what's going to be best for his honor and his glory. And, uh, and that's what we're trusting. But I'm praying for a full delivery. Full recovery, full delivery. I'm praying for God to raise him up again. And there's nothing we're asking God that's too difficult. And so we want to keep doing that. And the offering tonight, let's give. And uh, I, I just want to share those verses. been burning in my heart uh, today. But if not, they had a determination. They, they knew God was in control. They weren't going to flounder because, you know, so, so what? What's the worst thing the world can do to us? Give us a one-way ticket to heaven? I mean, the worst thing that can happen, if I, if I run out of here and die in a car wreck and don't feel sorry for me if I did, that, that car just bought me a one-way ticket to see Jesus and, uh, and, and won't regret a minute of it. And uh, so uh, let's pray tonight. Ask the Lord's blessing on the offering. Lead us in prayer, brother. Father, we just thank you so much for all your many blessings. God, thank you for all the 
freedom family. Lord, just thank you for Zane, Lord, what he all means to us. Lord, we know you can heal him as a, as a mighty physician, Lord God. We know you can. God, you're not where it's too small. You're too big for us, God. We, we don't deserve it, Lord, but if it would be your will, you would touch Zane, Lord. Just ask now that you'll bless the gift and the giver. Bless those that give. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have your Bibles ready. Well, it's a blessing to have Brother Fredericks back with us tonight. And I'm so thankful to God for bringing uh, him back to us. And though not 100%, I'm glad he's here. Whatever percentage his meter is at tonight, I'm glad he's here. And, uh, and I love him dearly. And I thank God for his friendship. And I thank God for allowing us to serve the Lord uh, together. And I'm so thankful for that. And I'm glad it's not, it's not hard to do that. It's easy. It's easy. Now, it's not easy serving the Lord. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, God didn't say it was going to be easy. But when, you, when, you're, when you're equally yoked, it don't, rub you, it don't rub sores on you. An unequal yoke, it'll rub blisters on you. But when, you, when you're under there with somebody pulling the same way you are, it don't rub blisters on you. It makes the labor a lot more enjoyable when you're both going the same way and headed in the same direction. I'm thankful that we have a man here like that. And I pray much for him. Pray for strength. And we're going to have a song. Have your Bibles ready. Y'all go ahead and come and sing for us tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Pray your blessed song. Bless Brother Fredericks as he stands to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
nations, whatever others do, I choose to be a Christian. As this world grows darker, my lamp will be with the love for the one who is worthy he gave his all so i will give mine i'll lay my life on the line i choose to be a christian i will follow christ Carry the cross that leads to life. I will be true, stand for my convictions. Whatever others do, I choose to be a Christian. I will be bold, unashamed. Of the gospel of his name. I choose to be a Christian. I will follow Christ, carry the cross that leads to life. I will be true, stand for my convictions. Whatever others do, I choose to be a Christian. I choose to be a Christian. I choose to be a Christian. Take your Bibles, go to 2 Corinthians. You know, for me, it was June 29th, 1990. I chose to be a Christian, but don't forget on Golgotha is when God chose us. I mean, uh, it's for everybody. Yeah, I made that decision, but he chose that he wanted us uh, even before Golgotha. He said, just follow this pattern. Here's a lamb, sacrifice it, sprinkle its blood, but... There's always been a plan for man, and I thank God for that. I'm glad to be here with you, church, and uh, here in the service, and I'll just get right to it. Not much. just want to kind of talk to you what the Lord's brought us through here the last few weeks. And um, aren't you proud of preacher? Let me say this. He put the T-shirt on. That's good for preacher, you know. This is the guy that wears a shirt and a tie, 98-degree weather at the church picnic, and so I'm glad he's dressing down a little bit. And I said, man, I was amazingly surprised. I'm glad you dressed that way. I said, and he didn't say anything about the way I was dressed, but I know he's got something to say. But I'll, uh, I took my son to see Richard Gibson, the suit man, and got him decked out for college. And he had this red coat and these white pants for like a little boy sitting in the corner. I said, well, look at that there. And then about a week later, Brother Jeff put this outfit in my office, and my kids have been trying to hide it ever since I got it. And... Uh, so I said, I'm going to wear it tonight. Preacher said, wear red, yellow, and blue. And they're like, Dad, please don't, don't. And that just made me even more want to wear it when they said not to. And it was just so encouraging to shake Miss Reba Wilson's hand. And she goes, good night. I thought Pat Boone was in our church tonight. <laughs> and so uh, I forgot what church he pastors. But anyway, she can tell you later, I think. And, uh, but it is good to be back. I'm grateful for people who love me and are trying to settle me down and to do what I'm supposed to, and I really am trying my best to do that. And um, my mom was able to come. Thank you so much. I said, it took me to get on a deathbed to get you to come visit me, huh? And uh, so then she had some nice words for me after that also. So uh, she's mama. And uh, But uh, basically what had happened, let's take you back just a few uh, maybe about a month from June 9th to the 29th, we took our missions trip. 
and then we got back on the 29th. July 1st was that Wednesday. We had teen night. Philip preached, and then we went through the slides, and you saw all the things that we did in the Bahamas. Then uh, the next night was our teen choir. We sang at Kerwin Baptist Church, and it was a blessing to their church there. <laughs> Excuse me. And then we had our 4th of July picnic, and then we left for teen camp on July 6th. Got back on the 10th. Lord gave us a tremendous week there. And that next Saturday, uh, following Saturday, was the 11th. That was one of our two basketball camps we ran here at the church. Uh, it was for those 8th grade and below. And had a great day. And uh, got a little sick that afternoon. I think Miss Peggy gave me some antacids or something just to take. But that was the extent of that day. Then Sunday was church. And then Monday went to my first of three days. We were hosting another 9th through 12th grade basketball camp here. And... Uh, <coughs> And um, got home about four, and I just kissed Debbie and said, sweetie, I just need to lay down for a little bit. I'm tired. And that was the last thing I remember. Now, from 4 to 10 p.m., evidently there's some stories that Preacher White, that Jimmy Smith, my wife, and even my kids can tell you because I don't remember that time. Um, I was told that somewhere around 6, Debbie came to check on me and said I was very delusional, um, just making stuff up. At some point, I think she called Preacher White, and Preacher was on the phone with me, and I think I was like, even in a weird tone, just saying, I don't want to talk to him. Don't put him on the phone. And, and uh, then I remember hearing his voice, and he said, we're going to get an ambulance for you if you don't get out of that bed. And they say my response was, oh, no, not an ambulance. Too expensive. That's a lot of love offerings. And... Uh, <laughs> So after that, I think somehow James and my son uh, got me out of the bed and carried me to the car and took me there. And um, then that was the same night Nathan uh, hit his head. And so Preacher and Jimmy were already at Brenner's. And then when Debbie pulled me, or who drove me? Uh, James, they, they drove me to the emergency room. Then Jimmy and Preacher, I was told, were there. And uh, Preacher was just watching me and laughing at me, I think. And uh, uh, they took me right straight back. Um, around 10 o'clock, they had uh, taken me into a CT skid, and that's where I kind of came to. And as they uh, were, the table was sliding out of the CT skin is when I kind of came to, and I just asked the orderly that had wheeled me in there, I said, sir, where am I? And he says, you're at Forsyth Medical Center. And, and I just about lost it. I, I was just nervous wreck. I said, where's, why am I here? I don't know, sir. I said, where's my wife and kids? Well, I don't know where they're at, sir. And, and um, I almost became very uh, hysterical because why am I at the hospital? Where's my wife? And you don't know where my kids are. I thought I was in a car wreck. I didn't know what happened. And so... Uh, they wheeled me back to the room, and, and Debbie was at the emergency room, and she was settling me down and now explaining to me all that had taken place. Um, they had drawn a lot of blood at this time, and then the doctor named um, Duncan came in and said that uh, Deb, I guess, was telling him the story, and she was trying to tell him he's probably just exhausted. It was a busy time. <coughs> and uh, they kept going to the Bahamas on that trip, and then where we had camp, and I think they were asking if I had received any tick bites or anything of that nature. So finally around midnight, I think Dr. Duncan was the one who said he was going to do a spinal tap to check for meningitis. And uh, my mind, and if any of you know evangelist Kirby Campbell, you know that's what kind of started him into the uh, pain of lifestyle he lives now, and I was a little nervous. But he looked me right in the eyes. This guy who's kind of freaky, he's got like a David Hasselhoff perm kind of a hair. And he looked me right in the face and said, Now, Clint, I'm not good at a lot of things, but I am good at spinal taps as long as you can stay still. And that was encouraging. It really was. And so uh, I laid on my side, grabbed my knees. Debbie was there, and he was feeling around down by my. He goes, Oh, good. There's a lot of space there. I don't know if that was a nice way of saying you're good and fat and we can do this no problem or what, but. He goes, yeah, I got a lot of space down there, and he rubs some alcohol or something, and uh, he goes, I'm not going to tell you it's a small poke, because it's not, but when he was doing that, he was very, very soothing and encouraging as he was uh, pulling the liquid out, and he said, it's very clear, that's a good sign, and it's very thin, that's another good sign. Now, I can't just say you don't have meningitis, but in the years I've seen this, we'll send it out to get tests. It doesn't look like any type like that. 
And then he, uh, his phone started to ring as he was explaining that. And he goes, that's normal, Clint. Don't worry about that. That always rings when I'm doing a spinal tap, but I've never answered it. And uh, so, so he went on to there. <coughs> and um, so, so those were the first few things they were looking at. That was Monday. And then I was in the hospital all day Tuesday. And that's where I met my doctor. And this is kind of a blessing that I didn't know this, that internal doctors at a hospital work on seven-day shifts. And so that Tuesday morning, I woke up and met my doctor, Dr. Okafor. And she came in and read through all the things that had taken place from the hallucinations and the delirium and uh, asked me how I felt. And she kept asking. And she even brought up, you know, some of the big six viruses in the Bahamas that come back, whether it was Brother Hopkins, I think you were trying to explain to preacher chicken genyu, uh, dengue fever, of course, swine flu, bird flu, things of that nature, and, of course, meningitis and malaria. So she says, those, those are at the lab. We won't get those for several days. The infectious disease came in and said, look, I'll send you home. I don't know why you want to wait here. And after a few hospital meals, I was agreeing with them that I probably don't want to stay there either. And uh, so then we did go home on Wednesday morning, but my fever wasn't gone. And Thursday at home was really, really bad. Uh, so Friday, Deb called my primary doctor and explained everything, and they said take him back in. So Friday night, I went back to the ER, and uh, they put me in Miss Ann Bull. She was at the ER. Preacher went to go visit Miss Ann. They discharged her out of room 43 and took me back into room 43 in the emergency room. So Freedom has their own little room there, I guess, in the emergency wing. And uh, I was dozing off here and there. My neck had swollen up extremely to the point to where my friend Tim Hicks, his family sang for us during the youth meeting. And uh, Tim, I hadn't seen him since May. He was at camp all summer, but he was in the room and he said, uh, Doc, um, his neck's not supposed to look as fat as my neck. I'll tell you that right now, that doesn't look right. And the doctors were taking, they then ran that CT scan where they put the fluid through your body to see what was in there. And then I kind of fell asleep and woke up and there was a doctor that scared me to death. He looked just like Daniel Ritchie. And, um, <laughs> When I woke up, I was like, what kind of sick joke is this, Daniel? You, you're not, your name's not Daniel, right? And he goes, no, I forgot his name, Dr. So-and-so, but Daniel, he looked just like you, man. And so we were talking back and forth, and he was nervous about the swelling in here, and he was, he was wanting, but he was going to consult and get ideas. He was wanting to either do a scope or cut, bring out a lymph node and, and test it because he didn't, it didn't look right to him. Well, they checked me in. And I stayed that night, and Saturday morning, here's the good thing, and I, that's why I didn't know it until then, Dr. Okafor was still there. And I guess she was one of the cons consults, and she had talked them out of doing any type of scope or any type of cutting, because she says she believed my body was doing what it was supposed to do. Oh, it's Dr. No, no, oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Daniel. <laughs> I promise. He did, <laughs> didn't he look just like Daniel? I was scary, thinking that he could be a doctor. No, um, and so... Uh, so Dr. Okafor said, no, I believe your body is fighting this virus, and it's doing everything right now to say, because they had initially diagnosed me since I didn't have the bacteria and the meningitis of having what they call encephalitis. And so Dr. Okafor was in the impression that all of this was fighting to say the virus is not going to get to my brain. And so that's why she suggested not to do the cutting or any type of surgery, which was a blessing that her day one was the, that Tuesday, and so when she saw me Saturday and saw me Sunday and saw me Monday, she progressively saw the swelling go down, and uh, so that was a blessing. We didn't have to go through that, and then uh, the temperature was gone, and the virus was working its way out of my body with the antibiotics, and so I took my last antibiotic on Monday, right? What's today? Yeah, and so yesterday was Tuesday, and I was antibiotic-free and felt very good and feel even better today, but stamina is the, is the key. I, I feel I have strength to do things, and about 10, 15 minutes into doing something, then there's just not much strength. So, but I believe I'm on the way out. I believe your prayers have helped that, and I thank you very much, church. Um, if you're in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, <coughs> I say this often when a tragedy hits or a tough time hits. When I'm standing in line at a funeral home, when I'm in a waiting room at a hospital, or when I'm just following up a visit maybe to see someone who I know is going through a tough time, is in the back of my mind I always think this, how in the world do people go through crisis 
without the Lord. I just can't comprehend it. And as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in, a in all Achaia, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Not some comfort, not even most comfort, but he's the God of all comfort. And as a result of that, he can do verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulations. And again, church, I can't tell you how exciting it was to go to the mailbox and get another handful of cards from church members, some very funny, some, some, uh, some uh, I can't read in the pulpit, but, but they were just good. They were just funny. And uh, they were an encouragement. But, but, but I know it's hard to understand this. There's no encouragement that you can get any better than from the Lord. And in those quiet times in that bed in the hospital or in my house or on the couch at the house, there is something about be still and know that I'm God. That in the craziness of all that's going on, this was all his plan. I'm not upset at God. I'm not mad at God. I'm not shaking my fist at God. I'm just trying to ask him to give me understanding and what am I supposed to get on the way out of this now. But I'm not mad and upset. I don't mean this to sound apathetic one bit. But I'm not mad and upset about Zane with God either. I'm very heartbroken for the Snyder family though, as you are. But can I echo what preacher said? Y'all were here before we were when he was born and only given a few days to live. Y'all were here before we were when he was given just a few years to live after they overcame one obstacle. And y'all were here before we were when they were doing all these other things. And the, can I tell you this? The same God that healed him then is the same God that's still alive today. That's where we take the comfort. who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. You know why God comforts us? So we then can turn and comfort others. If the Lord gives me strength, I'd like to comfort your teenagers over the next several years. The Lord still gives me strength and allows me to. That's what my goal is in life. And as God has comforted me, I'm going to try to comfort them. We must do our best to be a comfort. <coughs> it's easy to say that God does all things well when we are prospering. But when problems come instead of prosperity, and when sickness comes instead of health, and when trials replace tranquility, we must not be so ready to say Christ, we may not be so ready to say Christ doeth all things well. You know why? Because we're human. Because we're flesh. And if we're not careful when the tide turns, boy, yeah, it's great as long as it's not me. But let's remember what preacher's been teaching to us as a church this whole year. We're all, we're all one body. And when the big toe hurts, the whole foot hurts. And when the foot hurts, we limp. And when we limp, our back's out of alignment. And when our back's out of alignment, our, our spine hurts. And we, it just it affects everything. When we moved to California, a friend of mine, Steve Brockman, was a bus driver, and we would rent school buses. And Brother Daryl, I don't know if I was out here, but because it was, I guess they call it a charter, we weren't using it for school reasons. We had to put these yellow magnets that covered the word school, and we had to put these uh, covers on the red lights. Now, we weren't using them, but they said by law we had to cover them in the front and in the back. 
we got done on the bus route and I normally would climb up on the bus and take those things off for Steve Brockman, my driver, and for some reason, it was just one of those days I was finishing, sweeping out the bus, and Brother Steve had gotten on that bus, and he was pulling everything off, and he came ready to jump down, and he grabbed that side mirror, and as he went to jump off and his hand slid down, his wedding band got caught of the screw that holds the mirror in there. Steve, you know what I'm talking about. You've probably heard of this accident, but it literally popped off his finger from right above the knuckle. I was freaking out, as you can imagine. He goes, oh. I said, what just happened? It just sounded weird. I just turned around. I said, what just happened? He had his finger in his hand and a rag on this part of his finger. He goes, Clint, I believe I just lost my finger. And I'm just going, no. I'm like, what? What are you going to uh, what do we got to do? And uh, he says, could you take me to the hospital? I mean, he was cool as a cucumber. And I, I'm like, dude, you're losing blood. He says, that's all. He said, take me to the bunker. We went to his car, and he was sitting in there. We drove to the hospital. He was giving me directions, and we got there. And uh, uh, It was just a little bit too late, the way the, the finger was taken off. And by the time we got there, they, they couldn't put the finger back on. So he has a nub on his right hand, just like that. Just goes to the knuckle. I remember asking him later, I said, Brother Steve, I mean, what's life now without just that one part of the finger? He says, it's terrible. He says, do you realize how much you use this much of your ring finger? I said, not really. He says, next time you shampoo your hair and wash your hair, try to do it without that one part of your finger. He says, it just feels funny. He says, when the lady gives me my change back, when I order my coffee, it keeps dropping. She goes, do you realize how much change this little part of your finger saves from dropping on the floor? Here you go, sir, 47 cents. And it, there's, it goes through that hole that's right there. I'm saying that to say this, that all of us are important at Freedom Baptist Church. And if God has just given you the job to write encouraging notes, keep doing it. Keep doing it. If God has given you the ability to cook meals, my goodness, we only have five in our family, six with my mom. Some of you cook like we have 55 in our family. I, it's just, I almost feel we got to eat it and eat it and eat it and keep eating and keep eating. And my, my wife was just explaining to my mom, she says, that's the South. I mean, they, they show their love by cooking for you, you know. Oh, I don't feel good. All right, sit down. I'm going to make something. You know, that, that's kind of how it, that's the remedy. But can I say this, Freedom Baptist Church, as great as it is that you've done it to me, and I know you've done it to other our members, can we open up our eyes and see how our neighbors are? Can we keep our eyes open for them to see if we could do that to them? Oh, I'm not saying maybe the whole church cooks for them, but maybe you could be used to do that to your neighbor that you know about, to reach the community. I'm very grateful, but... God comforts us so we can comfort others. Others. Well, who needs help? If we'll take our eyes off of ourselves, we'll see that those needs that others have also. Through this, I was just reminded of a mantra that I tried to live by. As a young Christian, went off to Bible college, kind of on my own pretty much at that time. I was given this advice, and it was so good to me. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. We weren't a church family. So everything was learned in the school of hard knocks, as they say. I wasn't taught David and Goliath in junior church. I wasn't taught Daniel in the lion's den at primary church. I got saved at 18 and went off to Bible college and learned a lot on the run. And I can attest that still today, 25 years later, I can still say, number one, God is good. I don't understand why some things happen in my family the way they do or did, but I know this, God's good. Psalm 34, 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And you'll never know he's good until you first taste it. Hasn't Costco and Sam's Club made millions of dollars because they've got someone in there making minimum wage with a little scoop of something waiting for you to 
taste it. Oh, no, these weenies are better than any other, Frank. Come on, here, just take one. It's on. Come on, come on. Just. And some of us, you know, we used to take our kids there for lunch. It was just a little, get your beanie weenies here, come over here and get the drink, and then we come back. It was kind of a free lunch, and then we get to eat that, what, slice of pizza and a drink for 83 cents or something. You know, Sam's Club, we can't beat it, right? What are they trying to do? They're trying to whet your appetite for more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. One taste, you know what you're going to want? Another. And another. Don't be like Brother Clint when he grew up in the house and it was time to try vegetables. Here, take this. Mm -mm, No, no, I can tell it's green. It's not good for you. No, no, get away from me. Taste and see that, number one, God is good. Number two, principle I learned and still try to live by this is that God does good. God is good and God does good. Genesis 1, 4, and God saw the light that it was good. He created that light. Genesis 1, 10, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he the seas and God saw that it was good. And the earth brought forth grass and and herb yielding seed after its kind, the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1.18, he created two lights, the one to rule over the day and the other by night, and to divide the light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God made the beasts of the field after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God is good. God does good. And sometimes it's hard to understand this, but it's the truth. Thirdly, God doesn't allow anything to happen to us unless it's for our own good. Unless it's for our own good. I'll take you to Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, but... Parenting, don't we sometimes let the kids see the consequence? Because we've told them so many times before. But maybe this one time, instead of rescuing them, we just kind of let them face the consequences because maybe this time they'll learn. Since the culprit's here, my mother... Because you know where Michael's toy store is. That's the only store you need to go to at the mall when you're a kid. But mom has to stop and look at every window of every store at the mall. And that one time I kept going ahead, kept going, can't wait. All of a sudden I stopped and turned around. And there wasn't any mom. Brother Steve, can you imagine this? My mom stopped at a store and went inside of it. Boy, I got all the way down here, realized mom wasn't there. I just started crying like a baby. I found a mall security guard, and and by the time I was at that security guard, he stepped out the mall, the the store. Can I help you? Sir, I think I... So, ma'am, do you know this boy? Yes, that's my son. Okay, well, keep a better eye on him, ma'am. Well, I I am, trust me. I knew where he was the whole time. You know what I started doing after that? (laughs) Now, as a parent, she was still watching me. She could still see me. She wasn't just leaving me for dead, obviously. But she let that happen to me for my own good. And sometimes we as God's children get in a certain mood, 
get in a certain attitude, get a certain way, to where sometimes God allows things to happen to us for our own good. To remind us that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And I want to have a youth group that's exciting and is always doing things and planning things. But I'm also understanding that God wants us to do things and plan things for years ahead. I don't have to cram it all in a 38-day time period. Right? The life of Joseph. His brothers became envious. They sold him as a slave. Then he was in, uh, bought by Potiphar and used to be a help to him. Then he was put in prison after he was falsely accused. Then he was let out of prison and wound up being second in command. Man, the years of the ups and downs of going through that. And Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 and 20 says, Joseph said unto them, as he had revealed himself to his brothers, and said, I'm now second in command. And they thought the same thing any of you would have thought too if we did that to our brother. Uh-oh, we're in for it. Here comes revenge. Joseph's answer then was, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people. God is good. God does good. And God doesn't allow anything to happen to us in our lives unless it's for our own good. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Thank you. Let's stand together, shall we? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Miss Carla comes to play. What is it that God's doing in your life? What is it that God's doing in your life? God's, God's got a lesson for you. Be a good student. It'll be better for you. Be a good student. Allow God to work. God is never, God's never idle. You may not see his hand all the time, but he's always moving. He's always working. What is he trying to do in your life right now? How many of you would say tonight, Pastor, I know that God is working. He's doing something in my life. He's trying to teach me something, trying to help me with something. I know he is. Would you slip your hand up and pray for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad he is. And I'm glad you recognize it. So now, would you come tonight, as, before she begins to play, would you come and say, God, I want you to work in my life. To say no to to teaching is to say no to God working in your life. Did you understand that? To say I don't want it is to say God no, I don't want you to work in my life. That's spiritual suicide. How many of us would come tonight and say God I do. I invite you. I want you to do a work in my heart. Maybe do some hard things that are difficult. It may be hard. But God, you do them. Would you come and she plays? If you're at the altar, I want you to stay, stay down front if you could. Don't go back to your seat yet. Anyone else tonight, come and pray. Let God help you. God, I want you. I invite you. 
I'd be pleased. I'd be pleased for you to work. Well, there's some things that need some attention. There's some things in my life that need attention. And Lord, I invite you. I invite you to work on these hard things, these difficult things, these things that may hurt. While these are still at the altar, would you join us by coming down? Let's have a word of prayer, an altar of prayer for Zane, Sharon, Greg, Zach, Bob, Mary Catherine, please. We'll just join together down at the altar and have a season of prayer. We also want to pray for John Hofling. He's in the hospital today, and he'll be uh, he'll be operated on tomorrow. Little John, they just joined the church here a few weeks ago. Uh, you pray pray with me for him. Uh, Miss Pam will be having surgery tomorrow. Pam Ellison, let's pray for her and keep all these in prayer and uh, pray especially for Zane. Uh, God, God, we need a miracle right now and. Uh, the prognosis is not good, and um, they'll they'll teetering on making a decision tonight about uh, ventilation and so forth, and so very very serious uh, decision to be made. And we want to pray together and ask God to, Brother King. I know you're you're weary, but could you lift your voice and pray for us, please? You may return and be seated. I want to finish updating your own Zane situation. Last night, uh, they, they went in. I'll just be a few more moments. Um, basically, the heart, and, and turn, turn all that off back there. 